Swayam Prabha Digital India Educated India shall be proceeding to talk about the scholastic scholar St. Thomas Aquinas today. Scholastics constitute a major threshold in the history of philosophy between the period when the church had got stabilized and the early church scholars, the four doctors as they were known by the 5th century and modernity between the scholastics and the four doctors. Of course, there lay a huge chasm known as the dark ages. It is a time when no constructive, creative, philosophical output was produced, not even theologically. The four doctors, St. Ambrose, St. Augustine, St. Jerome and Gregory the Great, they were principally concerned with consolidating the position of the church vis-a-vis -vis the state and in uh, building the theological core structure of the church and of Catholic Christianity. If there were any pre-Christian philosophical influences, they were restricted to the influence of Plato, especially in the writings of St. Augustine and in a measure in the correspondences and writings of St. Jerome. However, at the end of the dark ages, you find scholasticism representing Christian scholarship revived and with a revived interest in the Greeks and constituting a crucial threshold between the earlier period and modernity. So, that is the period which we shall consider now, especially in relation to their economic ideas. Scholasticism represented the focusing of or refocusing of interest on the Greek classic period. The big difference is that while the four doctors and in their period the focus was more on Plato, the scholastics shifted attention to the student Aristotle. The big difference between Plato and Aristotle was not in the core structure, but in the method. Aristotle might be considered the empiricist, while Plato might be considered the idealist. However, they were both talking of the same substratum, the idea, but in the case of Aristotle, there is a positivity about his outlook, whereas in Plato, it is very negative. Aristotle's economic ideas feature principally at the core of St. Thomas Aquinas's writings. So, what did Aristotle have to say on the economy, the economic process? Briefly, let us take a look at that. First and foremost, Aristotle was looking at the domain of economics as only the household. So, the management of the economy as far as Aristotle would go would simply be management of the household. He was not thinking 
in terms of management of the city state, its economy, its resources. He was not thinking in terms of what was happening to trade, because the Greeks were great traders too. What happened to the government business in taxation, in spending, in building public works and more importantly, how did they manage to finance all the wars which they fought all the time? Because one of the principal features of the Greeks was their propensity to quarrel amongst themselves all the time. Yes. So, none of these things figured in Aristotle. Aristotle was looking at the economy as a household economy, how it earns its livelihood and what it does with itself. And very strong moral overtones in the way he looks at how household economy should be managed. Aristotle, for instance, talks about some kind of a natural price which prevails in a system, which is also a just price. But more importantly, he is talking in terms of different ways of earning money, earning an income. If a household produced a manufactured article, if it cultivated a plot of land and grew some output on the farm, Aristotle was pleased. But if the household was a trading household, if it made money by buying and selling goods and made the margin, Aristotle was not very patient with them, because he said that is not moral. Equally, Aristotle was very clear about charging a fee for use of funds. Suppose somebody lends somebody some funds, is it ethical or not to make the other person pay for the use of funds? In modern economics, you acknowledge this as almost a natural phenomenon. Interest is charged for the use of funds, simple as that. The person who advances the funds gets paid an interest for the privilege he has accorded you in letting you use his funds. But not so in the time of Aristotle. In fact, as, as you will see, not even till the time of St. Thomas Aquinas. Use of funds belonging to somebody else is fine. There is no problem with it, as long as the other one does not expect to be paid a fee, a charge, call it interest, call it anything, but a charge for use of the funds. It is called usury. Usury is unethical. Now, one of the things which is central to early Christianity, which persisted right through Christianity, through the history of the Catholic Church is this unique unequivocal condemnation of usury. Strange, because all Christians were Jews before they became Christians and Jews were traders. They had no ban, they had no taboo on the use of funds and for the payment of funds for the use of other people's funds. So, it was part of the history of the region from which early Christians came, but Christianity took its message from Plato and Aristotle, I think, and other earlier Greeks, rather than from their Hebrew ancestors. So, usury was not permitted, it was unethical. What about profits? Again, profits are fine if you made it through manufacture or agriculture. But if you made profits through trading, it is immoral, because you are making money by simply bringing goods 
and selling it to somebody else. Aristotle didn't think that the business of holding inventory on behalf of the society should be paid for. It was immoral. So, this was basically the broad structure of Aristotle's thinking. You find this being carried over right through into the writings of St. Thomas Aquinas. St. Thomas believed that there are three sets of laws which govern humanity. One of course, is divine law, law as revealed by God to human beings through the prophets and through the church. These laws are principally contained in the book, the Bible. The second are natural laws use naturalis. These are laws again which come from God, but which are prevalent in universally accepted norms and values. For example, divine laws would be more generic in terms of the kind of things which Christians are expected to be, but more specific would be natural laws which take the form of thou shalt not steal, thou shalt not commit adultery and so on and so forth. They are natural laws, which are basically divine laws that exist in the form of universally accepted norms among the Christians. Third, you have positive laws. Positive laws, which are simply laws that are enacted by a particular state or a particular society. These are man made. Yes. I still do not get the distinction between divine laws and natural laws. Well, I mean, you know, I am a bit I am a bit tickled when you say that because I do not either. But the fact is, you know, I think what is happening is divine laws are like revelations by God. They do not come in specific uh, texts or dialogues and so forth, whereas natural laws uh, constitute texts. For instance, I guess when uh, the, the Jews were talking of the laws of Moses, they were talking of natural laws as divine law revealed itself to Moses. But in principle, I do believe that uh, I am not very clear on that issue. Mm -hmm. I think both have a divine source, but I think one has a bit of text attached to it and the others might not be text. It will be more behavioral imperatives, which, uh, which are inherent in the church. So, positive laws are laws enacted by society the state. For instance, laws of property are positive laws. They are neither divine nor are they natural laws. So, a lot of economics and economic activity is governed by mostly natural laws to some extent by natural by sorry mostly positive laws and to some extent by natural laws and rarely by divine law. Like Aristotle, St. Thomas clearly looks at economics as lying within the domain of a household, nowhere beyond. Although so much time had passed since the time of Aristotle to the time of St. Thomas, and so many transformations had happened economically across the world by that time. But St. Thomas still persisted with the Aristotelian notion that economics is within the domain of the household.
and more important he has basic categories which he defines. For instance, what is a price which is just? It is like asking a question, what is a fair price? And he says, there are three types of, or he says, there might be three types of ways in which people might arrive at an idea of a just price. What might be the norm is one, when a large number of people believe that this is the way the price would be when there is no monopoly. Because when there is monopoly, it, is not, it has no claim to be just, because it only supports the monopolist. It is determined by the monopolist. So, when the monopolist is not controlling the market, and a large number of people believe that the market is not monopolistic, but competitive, then they have a notion that this is the just price. So, this kind of a norm or the normal is one way in which St. Thomas looks at the just price. The other of course, is that the just price should cover the cost of making the particular commodity. And in the times of St. Thomas, the principal cost of course, was the cost of effort involved in manufacturing or making the commodity. So, we can interpret that to mean the labor cost as another justification for a price being just, no more than what it cost in effort to make it. So, that is the second way of looking at just price. And the third way of looking at it is some kind of intrinsic value. We are not able to understand whether it is utility that Aquinas has in mind or whether he has some other notion of intrinsic value or worth of that article, it is not very clear. But evidently, it is some value possessed by the article or the commodity by itself. It does not come out of an external judgment as does for instance, the normal price as anticipated by a number of people when there is no monopoly or as the cost of making it, the effort of making it those are external criteria, but the intrinsic value evidently is some kind of internal criteria possessed by some internal criterion possessed by the commodity or article under question. So, these are three different ways in which the just price is looked upon by Aquinas and very pragmatically he realizes that the actual price is some kind of market determined price. It does not exactly say that it is an exchange value as would a modern person, but he says there is a notion of commutative justice when people are transacting in the marketplace, which basically means that you do not end up paying more than what you lose in getting that commodity. You part with some value you do not want to you do not want to part with more value than you gain from getting that commodity. So, there is some kind of a trade off which in modern market economy would be the trade off in a standard consumer behavior pattern or model. There is something like this implicit in Aquinas when he talks of commutative justice. So, actual price is determined in exchange activity in the marketplace based on the principle of commutative, commutative justice. Even this is a normative notion. He does not talk of this as a part and parcel of how exchange actually happens. In other words, he does not talk of this as a part of the pragmatism of the person who is acting in the market or of the rationality of the person. No, he says this is the way it should be. Nobody should pay more than what they get out of a transaction. So, it is more again like a normative principle than a an act of pragmatism or rationality, which a modern economist would look at it as. So, you have the just price and the actual price, then what is the just wage? 
So, you have the price for the commodities, then you have the wage for the labor, because labor is the principal factor of production. And he has some notion of subsistence like wage, a wage on which the laborer and his family may sustain themselves in, accord, in accordance with the social conditions and backgrounds to which they are used. So, essentially if you have a consumption which is determined according to the conditions of your living, then the wage should cover that, which is something like a subsistence wage, but does not explicate that issue. So, what about profits? Now, on profits Aquinas moves slightly away from Aristotle, he does not distinguish between profits from manufacture or productive activity as opposed to what Aristotle thought unproductive activity which is trading. So, Aquinas does not make the distinction between trading profits and profits from manufacture. He simply says profits should be adequate to cover the maintenance of the trader's family plus charity which he is entitled to give as a good Christian. And then interest is very interesting. Aquinas says interest comes in as a payment for possible default. In the sense suppose you have loaned somebody some fund for a period of 6 months and by the 5th month it appears to you as if the, mind, the money might not come back, the man is in problems. So, you have a talk with the man and say well look what, we, what do we do, suppose you cannot pay back the money, there is a risk involved of my losing my money. Then you have a discussion and the man says all right sir, maybe I will give you some 5 percent or 6 percent of the funds which you gave me as a cover for possible risk and interest comes in in that context. Interest comes in as a cover for risk of the funds being lost due to default. So, it comes in there, but what about interest as a payment for waiting? I have given you money for 6 months and I have lost the use of that money for 6 months, should not you be paying me something? Aquinas says no, of course not, of course not, because money is God given one and more importantly he says time is God given. When you say I have waited for 6 months, you are being simply impertinent because time is God's, it is not yours to dispose of as you think you are disposing. So, Aquinas is very clear about the ineligibility of any waiting over a period of time for claims on funds. In other words, what couple of hundred years after Aquinas became accepted as a simple abstinence fund or a fee for abstinence was not recognized by Aquinas. Of course, all such funds which are given for the use of funds other than the fear of risk of default is usury and usury is banned, usury is taboo, usury is not permitted. It is unethical. So, what is the sum which you might say about Aquinas? It is broadly moralistic, it is broadly suspicious of the whole business of making money and it is very restrictive of how business can be done and business cannot be done. And this restrictive quality, this suspicious quality is a central part of the Catholic church's attitude or a doctrine towards business. They are suspicious, they are restrictive, they think if business is left unmonitored, it is bad for the society. 
One very interesting variation you find in the thought of Aquinas is about property. As against the standard church notion that the whole earth has been given to mankind by God to enjoy without each coming in another's way of enjoying this earth. In short, disagreeing partially with the church's notion that private property is not a good thing to have, because when the church says the whole of earth is God's gift to mankind to be enjoyed in such a manner that no man's enjoyment of the earth interferes with another's. It could well be a communist philosophy, because that is exactly what the communists were talking about long, long after Aquinas. But Aquinas is very clear that private property in land might be and should be permitted, because that is the only incentive how people will be productive, how they will be creative in the use of property, in the use of resources. So, ownership and the magic of ownership thinks Aquinas is an important incentive for a prosperous human society. Of course, here too there are caveats. Aquinas says the right to own property is only the right to buy and sell it. It does not mean that you can use it whichever way you want, even if you have paid for it. No, you cannot use it as you wish, you have to follow other both positive and natural laws in the use of property. So much for Aquinas and his basic economic ideas. As you see, not just Aquinas, but the scholastic approach is fundamentally moralistic, fundamentally judgmental. It is all the time looking to see if the way people are acquiring money and using the money is right or wrong and is constantly trying to tell them how this money should be used. And this is the Catholic Church's doctrine on all these matters. Why does Aquinas, in fact we can wait for this a bit, why does Aquinas take the strong view about business, about interest, about profits. It is a basic reaction or a response of his times, particularly the church during his times to the fact that there was prosperity happening in the 13th century. Business was growing across Europe, manufacturing was growing across Europe people were constantly looking to find new sea routes to distant places distant places so that more business could be made across the seas so 13th century was an expansive period in the economy of europe and this expansion was not happening through growth of agriculture or growth of manufacture but was happening to growth of trade it was one of the earlier commercial revolutions smaller commercial revolutions that was happening in Europe. So, there is a basic suspicion in the church about this. It simply means that the secular economy is growing much too fast for my liking. It simply means that people are acquiring wealth, people are acquiring earnings and property which might lead them astray from the moral norms and paths given by God. In other words, there is an innate fear that divine and natural laws might be violated by people as they get more prosperous. So, this fundamental suspicion seems to underlie the restrictive nature of Aquinas's philosophy. Do you have any questions on this at this point? Okay. 
after Aquinas in a strange way in a 300 year period from 13th century to the 16th century as it were, European economy, European society goes through a dramatic transformation which leads to a completely different perspective on economics and the economic process. From simply being considered as profit making activity, business acquires respectability in society during this period. So, economics becomes liberated from the ecclesiastic constraints which had been imposed on it by the time of Aquinas. The second thing that happens in this period is that increasingly the power of reason comes to dominate in the day to day life of European people. Let us look at this in a little bit of a detail, not so much data on Europe of that time, but on what I mean when I say the power of reason becomes more and more in control of day to day life of people. Does it mean that following normative or moral prescriptions is unreasonable? Does it mean that following the dictates of your faith whether it is Christianity or Islam or anything is unreasonable, who can answer me? Akhil? Sure. You see I just made a statement that reason starts acquiring from 13th to 16th century more and more com control in the day to day lives of people in Europe. In contrast with the fact that hitherto their lives were more controlled by normative prescriptions, moral norms as given by religion and religious institutions. Does it mean is my question that religious institutions normative stipulations are fundamentally unreasonable. Charanya says yes. Yeah, I mean uh, you are free to be biased. It is lovely when one is biased. Maybe the institution uh, served an instrumental purpose in terms of organizing society and maintaining but uh, in terms of some of the norms that existed during the time of you, some of the norms that exist now that kind of um, tell people what they should or should not do in their personal lives, that's unreasonable. That's unreasonable. Good. So you are making a distinction here, a very momentous decision to distinguish between personal life and public life. You say that to restrict through norms lives which you think quote unquote personal is not right, unreasonable is what the word you use. Whereas public conduct to be regulated through normative strictures is quite reasonable. So, can you then expand a little bit on the basis on which you can distinguish between the public and private lives of people? generally because the, the issue is more general, it is not just this context. You cannot have 
you can't have public versus private life in the 13th century, 14th century, 15th century independently, no? So, land is considered as belonging to the public domain and not in a private domain, is that what you are saying? For example, what about something like the right to annul a marriage or divorce? Would you consider that as an illustration of this private public thing? Okay, then can you expand on it a bit? Divorce has, through history, you have seen that uh, it, in, there are instances where it does happen. Hmm. But uh, the reasons for it happening uh, have sometimes been governed by, uh, by what a larger authority thinks. For, for instance, um, if, if the husband is an alcoholic or uh, if he is abusive, then that could be a reason to annul the marriage if um, the wife and the children are getting severely uh, But uh, suppose just being generally not happy in the marriage is not a reason to annul the marriage. Whereas today, if you see it, a lot of people don't have any specific reason for annulling marriage except that. In their personal lives, they are not happy with the person they are with and they changed. So, so earlier that was not really a basis for uh, this thing. And also, uh, okay, that's a different topic. Simple incompatibility mm -hmm. is no reason for divorce, right? You got to be beaten or thrashed or abused in order to claim a divorce. I see what you mean. Sorry. Which is what I think Shannon is saying. Yeah, but uh, she she says that there is some minimum grounds based on which uh, I mean there are certain acceptable norms and there are certain mm -hmm. things that are not acceptable. I don't know if it's fair to draw such a distinction because what is fair to you might not be fair to, to that person. That's uh, exactly what I'm saying. Is that what you are saying? Yeah, I am saying that um, it is not, uh, it should be the person's personal prerogative to decide what is right or wrong for him and Isn't not. That's what you two are saying. Yeah, And not But what was the church's attitude towards divorce? It simply said no divorce for a long, long time. Yeah. No, no divorce. In fact, the church got particularly agitated if you want a divorce and you are a king. The church, I do not think, was particularly worried if you just left your wife and ran away somewhere as a poor man. It probably just announced that you are a bad guy and did not pursue you very much. But if a king did that, the church took a lot of pains to make sure long before Henry the Eighth, in fact, Henry the Eighth is what we see as a big textbook example, but I, I guess a couple of hundred years before that, there were kings in France whose divorces or appeals for divorce or annulment was not allowed by the Pope. It was considered that you give, you make a solemn covenant in front of God till death do us part 
we shall stay together and then the church simply said you have given the promise to God you can't just violate your promise to God that is it period. In Islam it is much more liberal you can you can say talaq four times or whatever and the woman too can file for a divorce and then there will be an inquiry into your application for divorce and if it is found reasonable it was granted. So, you see there is an institutional sanction always in India for instance there is no standard Hindu law prescription towards divorce, but according to different parts of the society to which you might belong there might be greater or less comfort in obtaining a divorce. For instance, certain castes have no provision for divorce. Uh, if you are a Rajput, no provision for divorce. If you are a Brahmin, no provision for divorce. But I know there are castes, they can simply remove the Mangal Sutra, the woman can simply remove it, give it to the man and go away. And the Panchayat meets and authorizes this. So, it is varied, but the fact remains that on a simple personal matter as you say on whether you should stay married to a person or not there is a big institutional sanction involved right. Now what probably was meant by the statement that reason took more control of this matter in these 300 year period is not because uh, is not so much in terms of violation of these institutional sanctions, but I think the interpretation of sanctions became more and more subject to rational verification process. I think so. This was also the period of renaissance and you know that in renaissance there was an overall renewal of thinking, there was an overall growth of humanism. So, Broadly we can say in this 300 period, we will have more reasons to talk about it slightly later, but broadly we know this much that reason took a stronger and stronger position in the diktat on how to run your life as opposed to sanction. You know what sanction does is what Aquinas said, this is the way you can take money for money, this is the way you cannot take money for money this is the way you can make profits, you cannot make more than this and so on and so forth. When reason comes into play, it questions all these sanctions, is that the way I should run my business, is that the way I should not run my business and so forth. The finest illustration of this is the whole attitude to business being switching dramatically during the 15th, in, during the 16th century. after Martin Luther questioned some of the fundamental crimes as he thought they were of the church. For example, there used to be a practice called indulgences, which simply mean what is indulgences Akhil? Please go and where? I mean you can get your sins resolved through a payment. Well, forgiven or something. That is one, that is one, that did not happen very often because the Christians uh, took a more serious view of it since than that. Uh, you might have to atone for it by saying some prayers and so on and so forth, but you know you did not pay to have your, to have your sins written off as yet. So, uh, but you are right, there is something which the ecclesiastic organizations permitted you to do for payment, which is basically being made an official. If my dad is the chief of this principality, prince so and so, x, y, z, whatever his name would be, then my dad might like to make me a bishop and he might may have a negotiation with the pope in Rome and they might decide on a particular price, 2000 
gilders or whatever. And then the, the pope would give his permission for my becoming a bishop and going through the investiture ceremony. This is called indulgence. That is the church granting its indulgence for a lay person becoming an ecclesiastic power holder. Now, this was the root of a lot of corruption in the church in those days and Martin Luther raised his voice against it. This is basically the voice of reason. That is what I am trying to say. Martin Luther also said, why should the church speak in Latin, which the common people do not understand. The word of God must be understood by man, because after all what is the dialogue in religion between God and man. So, as I have already told you, he insisted that the whole Bible comes in German. Not only that, he utilized the new technology of printing to get hold of a large number of Bibles printed in German and distributed to the German speaking public. This was again the voice of reason. Again the question of whether the church or Christianity had to depend on the existence of another world, another second life or life here and after in order to resolve the crisis of a human being's existence. I am saying this because as you know, as we have discussed it earlier, your sins are judged on the judgment day. Till then you say you stay interred in the churchyard, but on judgment day you are summoned and you rise. And then you appear in front of the Lord and the Lord passes a judgment saying it is hell and damnation for you, go. Or you have been a good person, virtuous person, so it is heaven for you. Or you hang on and wait, which is called limbo. So, you can go through all this. In other words, your solutions to the problems of current existence are in the life here and after, after life. So, Luther says no after life. Calvin, another reformer also said no afterlife, it is here. You pay the price for your actions now. The Lord is here, judgment is here, living is here, worship is living. So, this is also the voice of reason. So, you can see how in the very reformation of the church, it is the voice of reason which dominated. I will go back and take you to this little distinction which I drew for you some classes ago between structure and communitas. Who is the person, who is it that intervenes between a potential conflict between structure and communitas? Who intervenes when there is a potential rift apart in the human mind? The person is torn asunder by what he or she should do as per structured conduct and what he or she should do as per the dictates of his or her heart. It is reason. You reason with the person and say, well, look, this is the way society thinks about it and so forth and tell me what you want to do. And then the person says, no, no, no society may go fly a kite, I would rather do as I wish to do and then it goes back and forth. And what is the discourse here when it goes back and forth? It is a discourse of reason. So, reason is a crucial interrogator in the problem of existence when structure and communitas come face to face with each other. Am I not right? So, as reason, reason starts dominating, as the command of reason grows in your life, there is more and more of interrogation in the potential conflict between conduct which is structured by normative structures, religious structures, 
divine laws, natural laws and so forth and of course, positive laws and the other side which is your experience, which is your aspirations, which is your life. So, the interrogation is done by reason and when I say European society was coming more and more into the fold of reason in this period, I think renaissance ensured that this process of interrogation by reason became more and more and more applicable in a larger and larger set of contexts. So, this is what I think is meant when I said reason gains more and more hold over lives of people in Europe during this period. So, we will start after the break. <coughs>